20 seconds. Warm greetings to one and all. Once again, thank you all for joining the session with Online Dentistry. This is Dr. Anita Sajin, your hostess for the day. We'll be starting the session shortly. We'll wait for a couple of moments for the others to join. So meanwhile, let me brief you all over the journey of online dentistry. Right back from the lockdown days, online dentistry has been widely conducting online classes for dentists all over the world. And further, after the online scenario, we have begun our offline sessions over different places like Delhi, Pune, Hyderabad, etc. Now, over popular demand and request, we have started our online sessions one again, once again. So we are glad to inform you that on every second and fourth Wednesdays, mind it, on every second and fourth Wednesdays, we'll have our online sessions a complete learning experience. So mark your calendar on 2nd and 4th of Wednesdays over 9 p.m. for the online session. So we are glad and uh, we are glad over your overwhelming response. So kindly wait while we admit the participants for a couple of moments. So let's wait for the rest of them to join. Yeah, so we are admitting the participants. So kindly wait for a couple of moments.
So now we have over 94 participants and more to join. So now over to Binu sir, the CEO of Online Dentistry. Sir is a finest practitioner. He's right away He's very much interested in continuing dental education all over to the dentist to the world. So sir, over to you to introduce the speaker for the day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Anita. Yes. And uh, welcome one and all to this free online session from Online Dentistry. Now, Online Dentistry, if you guys, I'm sure many guys know about Online Dentistry. We started in 2008 as an offline, 100% offline firm. But from 2008 onwards, we had our candidates, every candidate registering for our program, we had online email as well as other modalities of tra transmitting these articles, reading materials. They, they had to prepare before coming for our program. So somehow we coined the term online industry way back in 2008. And the, on, the, and the website online dentistry.in from 2008. But I think many people still think that this is something that came during COVID times uh, uh, because of uh, the online main boom. No, we started in 2008 as offline, but the name was online dentistry. Then during COVID times, yeah, we came out with online sessions. March 24, the first lockdown by the India government. That's the time, that's the day we started online sessions. Started with simple online programs, case discussions for all those people who are in lockdown. And then that number increased. We started with a Zoom of 100. Within three, four days, it became 500 and then became 1,000 Zoom. That is the kind of response given to the dentist all over the world to online dentistry. Now, COVID is gone. Hopefully, COVID is gone. Now, last one year, I would say we have been actively into offline programs every month. But we kind of decided with so much of support and requests from people all over the world, we decided to have free online sessions again. So let me proudly introduce, starting from today, online industry at 9 p.m., starting from today, every second Wednesday and fourth Wednesday of a month, mark your calendar. There will be a free webinar, of course, with certificate of participation. But for certificate of participation, you have to register. Please, please note that you have to register to get the certificate of participation. But we will be having a program every Wednesday, second Wednesday and fourth Wednesday of a month starting from today. So topics can be varied. We will tell all that. We'll announce all that way ahead of time. Do not worry. Online industry started with the motto, redefining dental education and we did that we are still doing that conducting classes all over the world with so much of people in our platform more than 30000 people in our platform counting the amount of courses which we have conducted in the last 12 13 years yeah. so we are talking about lots of stuff that happened Myself, Dr. Bilu Abraham, an author artist practicing in Kerala, Alua, Alua in Kochi, Kerala, for the last 26 years. And my partner, Dr. Jobby Peter, the academic head, the backbone of academics of online dentistry. Dr. Jobby Peter, my pediatric dentist in my clinic for the last 14, 15 years. We sat together and decided on this concept called as online industry. And sir is the professor in HOD, the Department of Pediatric Dentistry in Anu Dental College. Passionate teacher. And going all around the world at this point of time on his philosophy, catch them young. 
and watch them grow. He is the most sought out speaker at this point of time all over the world in any conferences you take. We have almost 10 centers all around India at this point of time. We have classes in Delhi, Hyderabad, Pune, Bangalore, Chennai, Chidambaram, lots of centers. So wherever we get maximum inquiry, we go to that particular center and conduct the show there. I want you to introduce to one thing, very important thing. Please note this next Sunday, 18th December. We have a one full day online program. Again, online program at the comforts of your house. You can sit and listen to complete early age expansions, whether it's slow, whether it's rapid. Listen to Dr. Joby. One full day on expansions and we have even decided to keep the recordings for a stipulated period of time of course but we always suggest and those who know us will understand we always suggest be with Dr. Joby that full Sunday believe me it's worth it ask him doubts right away watching recordings no fun but you'll still learn that I agree but try to be there Try to be with Dr. Jobby. Ask questions right away and get things clarified right away. That's what all about expansions coming up this Sunday. Now, the next free session, I told you, every second and fourth Wednesday are free sessions. So the next free session is myself doing a topic on basic dental photography. I'll be covering about the importance of good photograph in your practice. And what is this good photograph? What is this excellent photograph? How do you compare? Do you need a mobile? You, do, is mobile okay? Or do you need an SLR? I'll be talking about all that in the next free session coming up December 28th. Guys, mark it down. Every second and fourth Wednesday, 9 p.m., wherever you are, please try to log in into this free sessions. With the overwhelming response, we have even opened up the YouTube and the Facebook link live for, for those people who have issues in getting into Zoom. So please note these dates. Another big landmark in our path is this one full year advanced mastership program on myofunctional therapy. This is for those people who want to go in depth into myofunctional therapy, a program conducted in Anno Dental College, completely in college, one year program, but split into modules for the comfort of practitioners. You come three days a month, and then after three months, you come another three days. And within one year, you get this. Uh, advanced mastership certificate in myofunctional therapy. And the best part is you are working on patients. You will be given patients. You will be taking impression, photo, everything. You'll be learning about photo taking. You'll be turning about learning about impressions there. You'll be learning about all sorts of basic stuff. And then next module will go to the next level on appliances, specific appliances, appliance delivery. You will be delivering appliances on the patient. You'll be seeing the progress every three months when you come again in the next module. One full year program on patients. Guys, those who are interested in getting that myofunctional part into your practice in depth, this is the way to go. All the dates, everything is fixed. One module is already over. And those guys are coming for the second module in Jan. But due to the overwhelming response, we opened up one more module. So one more module one is going to start in Jan. While the module one that started in September, those guys are coming again for module two next month. So what I'm trying to tell you is that's the response we are getting from this one year myofunctional therapy on patient in dental college. And that too in college where there are lots of patients. There's Anno Dental College with the maximum number of patients at this point of time. A number of seats for that is very limited. Uh, as far as I got the last info is one or two seats. That is it. So if you're interested in that, get in touch with, uh, with the team and they will guide you on that. Then in Feb, 
Feb 10, 11, and 12, we have a full three-day program, three-day program on myofunctional therapy, three-day program, that's it. Three full days with myself and Dr. Jobby, learning about the complete diagnosis and the treatment planning of a young age malocclusion. So be there. And interestingly, due to the overwhelming demand, we have even decided to have a straight to our orthodontic program for those practitioners who want to incorporate straight to our ortho into their practice. Parallelly, that's, good, so that's also going to happen that 10th, 11th, and 12th in Chennai. Keep in touch with us. Show us your, I mean, let me, let us know your interest, whether you are into myofunctional or you want to go into, directly into straight wear orthodontics. Let us know. We will guide you. We will have a small interview with the faculty. We will guide you. We will let you know which is the best course for you. So that's about February. Guys, again, I'm telling you, every second and fourth month, Online industry at 9 p.m. Note it down. It's going to be there. Something interesting will be there. That's my guarantee. Something interesting. It may not be interesting for everybody, but we are looking at a program that is interesting for everybody. For example, today, that's implantology. Basic implantology by Dr. Joe Spolzer. I don't think there's any other general topic we can choose as the inaugural topic of our free online webinar, which has been kept on a hold for the last one year when we thought COVID is gone. Now COVID is gone, I agree, but we decided to come back to that free program. So that's today's program, Dr. Joe Sposal's program on implantology. These are our details, these are our number. Anytime, feel free to WhatsApp us, check our website, Please let us know your interest in learning. What do you want to learn? About the free program, second and fourth Wednesday, I'm stressing you once more. If anybody listening to me would like to know about a specific topic, please let us know. Please tell us. We have survey team. We have a whole team working behind on the majority of the uh, uh, inquiries. We will get the best faculty possible for everything. That's my guarantee. But give us feedbacks on which all topics you would like to hear. Also, anybody listening to me at this point of time, our speakers, we have chance for young budding speakers to come up into this platform. One, one day, one hour platform free program. They can come and talk in our platform. Just contact us. We will see your topic. We will see your presentation and we will let you in. And one of the free sessions coming up every month, two sessions every month from starting from today. So please note these numbers. Feel free to contact us. We will be definitely, we are completely open to criticism and suggestions. That's it. With that, it's my duty to introduce the speaker of tonight, Dr. Joe Paul, sir. Great friend of mine. Before even talking about his uh, professional thing, you know what I would like to tell that is such a passionate cyclist. If there is a Sunday, that Sunday he'll be on a cycle. Kilometers on a cycle. Passion. And a fine dentist. 1996 Vinayaga Mission Salem product. And then Government Dental College Trivandrum Periodontics MDS. Great personality to meet, guys. He has won, won multiple awards, including the Young Scientist Award. Everything. I don't want to read. There's a huge list in front of me to read. We don't have that kind of time. But let me tell you, he is a passionate teacher. Practitioner, cyclist, family man. I know him very well. Dr. Josepo, sir, thank you so much for in accepting our invitation and coming into our platform. His number of publications and all that is like beyond a level. At this point of time, he is the student's dean of Anu Dental College. I see Anu Dental College is a college which is NAC accredited uh, dental college in Kerala. To become a student's dean there, that itself shows the amount of stuff he has gone through, the amount of publications, 
researches all that he has gone through. I don't want to waste too much time of George Paul, sir. With these words, let me introduce one of the finest periodontists I have met in the dental fraternity. Finest personality I have met. Sir, Dr. Joe Paul, it's over to you. So good evening, everyone. At the outset, uh, I would really like to thank uh, the directors of uh, online dentistry, Dr. Binu and uh, Dr. Joby for giving me yet another chance. And I think this is the third time I am presenting on the platform of online dentistry. And uh, I was, I like everybody else, I think was thinking that uh, online dentistry started during COVID times. Thank you, Binu for that uh, information that started way back. And uh, thank you, Binu, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, I am honored, I'm flattered. Well, uh, guys, um, we're just a couple of hours from the very interesting World Cup match between France and Morocco. And guys, I vote for France and I hope uh, they break hearts of Argentine fans. But let's get on with our topic today. That is, uh, I'm going to speak on the basic aspects of implantology or uh, what a beginner in implantology should know about. Now, I know that there are many practitioners over here. And you would have come across this situation of a missing teeth in relation to an upper anterior teeth or in a posterior region. Now, the question that I want to put forward to all of you here is, how many of you will give implant as a replacement for this missing teeth? And if anybody is not giving implant, what is the reason? Now, <clears throat> from what I've gathered, there are two things that usually deter people from suggesting an implant support restoration for a patient. One is they think that implants can fail. The second aspect is many of them are not trained in the different aspects of implantology. Now, I'll address the first aspect <clears throat> that is regarding the success of implants. Now, we have 50 years and more of documented implant research, which shows that more than 90 to 95 percentage of implants are successful. Then, ladies and gentlemen, what is stopping you <clears throat> from suggesting an implant supported restoration for your patient. The second thing probably that deter people from suggesting an implant is because they don't have a basic idea about implants. Yes, implant science is something that you have to learn. There are umpteen number of companies worldwide, number of gadgets, a lot of techniques involved. So you need a basic training. So even when I did my UG, we were not exposed to implants. Later, I got a glimpse of implant probably during the third year of my post-graduation. Now, a person joining post-graduation in periodontics, prosthodontics, or probably oral surgery may be exposed to implants. And the others may not be. So what is your take or how are you going to uh, get along with these lines. So one thing is you can join a course. There are empty number of courses. And this will give an idea about uh, how to get implants, how to do implants. 
So basically, what we are going to discuss today is we are going to discuss what a beginner should know about implants. Okay. What I'm going to discuss today is how to replace a missing tooth with implants. Now, the same principles apply to replacement of multiple missing tooth. And when you do a full mouth rehabilitation, these same principles are again coming into work. But only thing is that probably there are certain modifications that you have to consider. So with this, let us go to the topic. So these are the different headings under which I'm going to discuss today. The first and foremost is medical considerations. Now, is there any absolute contraindication for a patient not to have implants? Now, I think one contraindication might be probably an allergy to titanium, which is probably very rare. Now, there are certain conditions which warrant special attention. And one of the most important things, as all of you know, is probably uncontrolled diabetes and patient under insulin therapy for a long period of time. But even in such patients, even if they control their blood sugar levels, you can place implants. The next condition is osteoporosis, where the bone density is less. The patient may be treated with a drug which is known as bisphosphonates, which is noted to induce some sort of osteoradian necrosis. So in such patients also, you can give implants, but you have to take certain precautions. Hyperparathyroidism, post irradiation all these are conditions which warrant special attention. These are not contraindications, but these are conditions which require special attention. That is all, okay? The second and the most important aspect, probably among all these different aspects, is the edangular space concentration. If you don't have enough space to place an implant and give a restoration over that, then you can't provide or implant should not be a solution for that patient. So what are the things that you have to consider here? Now here you have to consider the width, the length, the height, angulation, and something as some terminology known as crown height space. Now we are going to discuss each of these in detail. First we'll discuss about this is the length. Length means the distance between two adjacent teeth. What is the measurement between two adjacent teeth? With this, this dimension, that is the width of the bone that is present in the edangular side. Height means till what depth you can place an, ima in, an implant. What should be the length of implant that you are going to place? <clears throat> now, when you talk of length, now, after doing an osteotomy or when you place an implant, there should be a distance of 1.5 millimeter from the implant to the adjacent tooth, okay, on either side. Now, we have the smallest of diameter of implants, mostly for most of these uh, implant companies is about 3 millimeter. So, 3 millimeter is the diameter of the implant here, 1.5 millimeter on either side. So six millimeter is the minimum distance that should be there between two natural teeth to place an implant. If you don't have that distance, you can suggest implant for that patient. Simple. And it is the mesiodistal dimension that actually determines the diameter. Now, how much of width you have here, if the width here is very less, that actually determines the diameter. So that is about length. Now, what is the distance between when you place multiple implants? When you place multiple implants, you should have a distance of three millimeter between adjacent implants. Now, what is the need for this 1.5 millimeter and three millimeter? Now, this is for the papilla to form. This is so that the prosthetic components here do not come and hit it against each other. The patient can maintain well to develop a harmonious occlusion. All these are important to maintain this distance. And mind you, so, so what is the minimum distance that is needed to place two implants? So one implant is, is three millimeter in diameter. The distance between three mil, two implants is three millimeter. Next implant is three millimeter. So this totally is nine millimeter. 
So 1.5 millimeter this side and 1.5 millimeter this side. So 12 mm. So if you have two, 12 mm of or more of length, you can place more than two, want more than one implant. Okay. Now next aspect is width of implant. Now <clears throat> the problem about width is after the tooth is lost, there are dimensional changes which actually results in reduction of the depth, of depth, I mean, the width of implants. So what the ideally, after placing or after doing osteotomy, there should be at least one millimeter on the buccal aspect and one millimeter on the lingual or the palatal aspect. So that is the amount of bone that you should have. So whatever diameter of implant that you're going to place, Ideally, there should be one millimeter on the label aspect and one millimeter on the lingual aspect. So that is the width consideration. Then the next most important consideration, mostly when you come to patients who are looking at implants is the height of implants. Now, where does height come into uh, place? One is in the anterior nasal region where you have the floor of the nose. Whenever a tooth is lost, there is pneumatization of the maxillary sinus and this height reduces. In the posterior mandible, we all know that we have the nerve, inferior alveolar nerve and vessels. So these are where you have anatomical limitations. And these are where you have to consider, you have to make your diagnosis very perfect so that you can give an equately height without any interference with the anatomical structures. And when you place an implant in relation to the inferior alveolar nerve, you should always stay about two millimeter away from that canal. That is something that you should know. The next aspect is angulation. Now, when you place an implant, it should always be parallel to the adjacent tooth or parallel to the tooth that was missing. And it should be perpendicular to the occlusal plane. So when you are doing implants, you can actually use a paralleling pin after the initial drilling so that you can know that your implant, the implant that you are going is, that you are placing is parallel to the adjacent teeth, right? The next important thing is something known as crown height space. Now, this was a term that was proposed by Mish way back in 2005. Now, you all do a implant, but during the second stage, when the patient comes for impression, if there are not, if there isn't any space, I mean, space for giving a restoration properly, what is the need in giving an implant there? So, for that, you need something known as crown height space. Now, in the posterior teeth, it is the distance from the crest of the bone to the plane of the occlusion. Now, many people go take this wrong. It, it is not from the crest of the bone to the tip of the cusp. It is to the plane of the occlusion. And in the anterior tooth, again, it is from the crest of the bone to the incisal tip, to the incisal tip. Ideally, you should need a crownite space of about 8 to 12 millimeter. That is something that is ideally. And beyond 15, it is always considered as excessive and it results in cantilever forces. Now, when you look at this picture, all of these implants are placed at the same level. Look, to attain occlusion, you have a prosthesis of different length. Now, whenever this is up to about 12 millimeter, but beyond 12 or beyond 15 when it goes, there is always going to be a vertical cantilever here. And when you give a screw retained restoration here, always there is a chance of breakage or the screw becoming loose. And always also there is more of uh, pressure on this implant bone interferes, interface, which may result in bone loss there. So that was all about the, sorry, <clears throat> that is all about the, the quantity of bone. Now, is quantity of bone only important? No. The quality of bone is also very important. So we are going to talk about bone density. Now in Kerala, you find different trees. One tree that you commonly find is this tree, which is the rubber tree. 
another tree which is usually used for making houses building houses is the teak wood tree okay suppose you are going to hammer a nail into this both this wood now it be very easy to hammer a nail into this rubber tree or rub wood rather than the teak wood and it will be very easy to remove the nail from that wood also so it is the quality of the wood that matters so this this same principle applies to implantology why the reason is because different areas in the mouth have got different density now there's a wonderful classification which was given by Carl Misch in 1998 and he has classified this density of bone into four categories d1 d2 d3 and d4 d1 is dense very dense cortical bone which is mainly seen in the mandibular anterior areas when you talk of d2 <clears throat> you have a little bit of more cortical but uh, there is cancellous bone also anterior mandible posterior mandible anterior maxilla now when you talk of d3 you have very little cortical bone and more of this cancellous bone anterior maxilla posterior maxilla posterior mandible and when you have d4 that is the <clears throat> the quality of bone that is least desirable is mainly seen in relation to the posterior maxillary teeth now this is how they look this you are you find lot of cortical bone here very little trabecular bone here you have a very good thick uh, cortical bone very dense trabecular bone but look at this is porous and look the spaces have been increased very thin porous bone large spaces here the quality of bone is very very less here so you have to do certain modifications when you find less dense bone one of the important aspects that you have to do is probably when the bone is very lens very less dense what you can do is probably you can instead of drilling the bone you try to condense the bone so after the initial drilling what you can do is you can you you can use osteotomes to condense the bone so the quality of bone is improved so here you have a you actually you have new technique now which is known as osteodensification by which you use different types of bone and you, you use different types of burrs which actually doesn't remove bone but they contents the bone to the surrounding areas so the next aspect is imaging now without diagnosis implantology cannot be practiced and for that you need proper diagnostic imaging now when you look at imaging this can be the implantology imaging is there in every aspect so before you place implant for pre surgical planning during a place implant during the intra operative phase and then the third phase that is the post prosthetic image after you place the uh, implant during the prosthetic phase as well as, as after you load the image in all these phases you need diagnostic imaging now what are the different modalities we have now you have empty number of modalities that are available now but basically you rely on three different types of radiographs periapical the, the panoramic and the gold standard that is needed for implantology or for every implantologist your life becomes very 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 easy if you have a cbct okay we'll discuss now what is a cbct and what is the information that cbct gives so for that we'll look at this apple here now this apple can be cut like this that is a cross sectional cut or this apple can be cut like this also so when an apple is cut like this now if a mandible area of a patient is cut like this and 1 mm slice is being taken you get an image like this you always also can cut this like this that is a axial slice so if you cut the mandible like this you get an image like this 
And if you want a panoramic view, you can cut like this and you can get a panoramic view. Now, these are the informations in one millimeter slices that you obtain from a CBCT. And how can you use the information from CBCT in your diagnosis and treatment planning? I'll explain. Now, just look at this case. This was a case where uh, uh, one of the premolars was extracted later on. I mean, extracted for orthodontic treatment. Then the later on, the other next premolar was again extracted due to uh, extensive caries. So now this was the a part of the CBCT you can see here. This is where you can see the you can see the sinus here. Now here, when you look, you can find uh, uh, the distance is about eight point six between the adjacent teeth. When you go a little bit, two or three millimeters up, firstly you have twelve millimeter. As you go down again, you can see the distance. So this in, a, in an axial slice looks like this. But what ex the slice that actually you need, the information that you need to place an implant is a slice like this that goes like this. And this is that slice. So this slice, gives, this is your maxillary sinus here. And the same maxillary sinus is here. And this is the length or the height of the implant that you can place. The height here is 12.5 millimeter. And when you look at the width, at the crest, you have 4.8 millimeter. You go about two millimeter down to the bone, you, you have about 7.4. .7 you go a little more down, you have 8.1 millimeter. So with this information, if you have a slice like this, this will help you that, to know that, yes, there is a sinus here then what is the width of implant that you can actually place here? Okay, you, you plan to place an implant about subcrestly, that's about two millimeter. When it goes two millimeter, you have a width of about 7.5 millimeter. You want one millimeter on either side, on the buccal aspect and the lingual aspect. So what is the implant size? What probably you would suggest? You would suggest an implant of probably about 4.2. So you, when you add one 1.5 millimeter on the other side, it will give about 7.4. So your width is going to be about seven, a diameter of the implant is going to be about 4.2. Now you have 12.5 millimeter here. Now you usually you place most of the implants subcrustly about two millimeter just beneath the the crust about two millimeter down. So my, you reduce about 10 mm. So if you take an implant of 10 mm, so that will go up subcrustly and it will stay away from the sinus. So 4.2 millimeter will be your width of the implant and 10 millimeter will be your height of the implant. Okay. Now you have the software there with the CBCT, most of the CBCT, where you can virtually place that implant and see in the patient. Okay, you, 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 whatever implant you are play, you are using Noble or you are using Stroman or using Adin implants. Okay, the this software will have a library which from that you take a particular implant that you are going to place and virtually you place that in the area and look and how it looks. <coughs> That was, this was all about pre-operative, okay? Now, when you do implants, there are certain things you have to know. One is, as I told you before, you have to know whether it is properly angulated. The second thing that you should know is whether you are away from anatomic structures, okay? So, you make the pilot drill or the initial drilling and then what you do is you insert a pin like which is known as a paralleling pin. So in this paralleling pin, so you know that you, it is away from this, it is away from this. Okay, uh, you have it's almost parallel to the adjacent to. Okay, your parallelism is fine. Now you have the maxillary sinus here. You have not encroached upon the sinus. Now in sinus is okay. When it comes about inferior alveolar canal or the anterior part of the nasal cavity, that is different thing. So you shouldn't go beyond that. Okay, when you have to stay away from that at a particular distance from that. So here, 
uh, this the beauty about this thing is this paralink pen has got one millimeter sections so in this one millimeter section you can actually look at how deep how deep you have gone also your osteotomy has gone so, so depending upon that you can uh, adjust with after your pilot drilling you can go with your subsequent drills and complete your osteotomy and then you place an implant like this 4.2 into 10 millimeter uh, is parallel to the other <coughs> uh, teeth and away from the the sinus also okay so that is intraoperative so preoperatively you need imaging intraoperatively you need, uh, need imaging then this prosthetic phase when the patients come for impression okay you have to attach certain components onto the implant and then take impressions the problem is this part of this interface is usually sub gingivally and you may not be able to visualize that okay you may be tightening the screw over here when you take you place an impression post and then you, <coughs> you try to uh, take an impression like this if there's a if you take a radiograph you find that it is not properly aligned when you so if you properly align it it, it be like this if you take an impression like this and send to the lab and when the final process comes it will never go it never going to fit so that is the importance of the imaging during the prosthetic phase so after during the prosthetic phase you have to take that so that you you make sure that you are taking a proper impression then <clears throat> after the prosthetic phase after loading what you have to do is again you have to take an impression and then you have to compare it at regular intervals so that you look at whether any crystal i mean crystal bone loss or any peri implant is happening there or not right so that was all about diagnostic imaging <clears throat> the next <clears throat> thing that has really made uh, implantology really simple is this concept known as guided surgery again this basically works on the principle of cbct okay with cbct you have a three dimensional image okay right all the other will give about two dimensional image only here you get a two three dimensional image so from the cbct you are actually you can make a cast you know at what distance the nerve is now you can actually plan in which way you can give an implant to that patient so what you can do is you, <clears throat> you can make a sleeve like this and give to the practitioner who is practicing implants okay so this sleeve is going to fit onto the tooth it's like a cap splint onto that you have this particular sleeve suppose you are going to do a noble biopsy or an anti implant so you should tell the people who are making this uh, guides that i'm going to do this particular so they will make a sleeve corresponding to the implant that you are going to put there and you have specialized drills here so that it it will go actually through that and it has stoppers to note the measurement so after giving lock anesthesia you just have to place the splint you don't have to even open up the flap here and just continue drilling they will give you a prescription at what drill so start with 2 mm 3 depending upon what is the height and the diameter that you want to achieve you just go about drilling and then place implant implantology has become very very simple with this that is guided surgery <clears throat> now one of the important things that uh, people often um have doubt is when to place an implant now what was the earliest concept earlier when i think when we uh, started implant so when i got introduced to implant the first uh, the concept was you know you extract a tooth <clears throat> you wait for about 6 months then you place implant then again you wait for another 4 to 6 months and then give a <clears throat> prosthesis look the patient has come for a missing tooth or the patient has got a tooth with poor prognosis which need to be replaced and that to need to be replaced at the earliest so <clears throat> what is the concept now the concept now is whenever possible whenever you are doing extraction 
the same sitting to do an implant. That is known as impeded implant placement. Now, not all cases are cases for immediate implant placement. Now, there may be a, a teeth associated with a large periapical lesion, which probably you can't gra <coughs> degranulate. Okay, then there won't be a primary closure. There will be a large gap lesion, some other. So, in some cases, you probably may not be able to place an immediate implant. In such cases, you may have to wait for a period of probably within eight weeks. That is known as delay, immediate delay or early implant placement or the usual old protocol. That is, you extract, wait for about six months and then place an implant. But <clears throat> the, the good thing about immediate placement is, again, fewer treatment appointments, morbidity is less, the tissue loss is the total treatment time is the patient is getting a tooth as early as possible. That is the beauty of immediate implant placement. Now, this is just, I just want to share a case with you. You can see that this is a teeth uh, that had undergone root canal treatment, got fractured. So we atraumatically extracted the tooth. And then we went about with uh, placing an implant. Now, what I want to show you here is, you know, look at the level of the gingiva before extraction. You can see that this is, this is about this is about, about one millimeter or so. On. Now, post-extraction, after the implant placement during the impression phase, you may find that there is not much, probably about 0.5 millimeter has gone apically. But if you had waited for this teeth to heal for a longer period of time and then place implant, probably the level would have been much, much more apically, which would have been much anesthetic. So whenever possible, try to place implants during the extraction itself. Now, another thing is when to load an implant. Now, you're placing an implant. Over that, you have to place a prosthesis. The patient has not come for an implant. The patient has come for a prosthesis. Okay? So, basically, when do you load the implant? The, the original concept was you always have to uh, submerge the implant uh, and then wait for six months and then load the implant. But later, what the evidence shows is that even when the implant is left exposed to the oral cavity, it will oceanate. But later, what happens is it found that you have more of implant stability and less of marginal bone loss when the implants are loaded at an earlier level compared to submerged implants. So the, the, the information from these studies are that, that you can load an implant at the earliest, at the time of placement also, placement also. But you can't do that in all the cases. Now, when do you do? Now, when you classify loading, you can classify this as immediate loading. That is what I said. Now, you do it within 24 hours of the implant being placed. It's called as immediate Within a few days or weeks, it is called as early loading or functional loading. Now, if you, the original protocol, wait for six months or four or six months and then load the implant, that is known as delayed protocol. Now, when do you immediately load? Now, when you are placing an implant, you are going to torque the implant. When you torque the implant, the, the torque, the, 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 your ratchet will have you can, with the ratchet, you can measure the torque. So if you have a torque of more than 30 Newton per centimeter, or when you try to reverse, we try to remove the implant, again, if you have a torque of more than 25 Newton per centimeter, such are the implants that are candidates for immediate loading. Now, another instrument that can be used to check for implant stability is an in, <coughs> instrument which is known as um, Austell's device, which works on something, the principle of resonance frequency analysis. Now, here, base, if you have a value of more than 60, you know that the implant is stable and then you can load the implant. In such cases, you can load. If, if, the, if your torque is less than 30, then <clears throat> don't forget, forget about loading. You do a 
delayed loading. <laughs> so that is the, uh, the beauty of immediate loading is that immediately the aesthetics and the function is restored. And um, you are giving a provisional there. You, even though you say that you're loading, it's probably out of occlusion, okay? But the patient is getting a tooth over there. And the good thing about that is when you place a prosthesis there, that, that, that provisional restoration actually molds the surrounding soft tissue so that when you give the final prosthesis, it will be very, very aesthetic, especially in the anterior aesthetic zone. So that is the beauty of immediate loading. Now, this was a case which we did again, a root canal treated teeth which had crown got fractured. But when we took a CBC, we found that there's a periapical infection. So we thought that we'll extract the tooth and then place an implant there. So we extracted this tooth and we placed an implant like this here. So we placed an implant like this and then we gave a <coughs> restoration like this. So the patient actually, uh, this was the condition after just before the uh, the process was attached. So from this area, you place an implant. So this, this process is, so this is going to guide the soft tissue here. So once it heals, you'll get good emergence profile here. That is the beauty of that. So from this situation, we could take this patient to this situation immediately, immediately post-operatively. So, <clears throat> next is uh, something we'll discuss about surgical considerations. Now, I discussed uh, that uh, you should need a sufficient width, that is one millimeter on the buccal and that one millimeter on the labial aspect. There should be a sufficient height. But whenever you see a patient who is coming for implant, the biggest problem is most of the patients won't have all these, won't be an ideal case. So what you have to do is, in some cases, what is the, the ridge may be very thin. In some cases, the sinus would have pneumatized. So here you have to modify your surgical technique depending upon that. You can't do a regular osteotomy and place an implant. In such cases, you can do certain surgical modification. I'll just discuss a tip of the iceberg regarding this surgical modification, two or three procedures which we did, okay? Because we have time limitation, I can't explain everything here. So this is a case that came to us. You can see, look, this is a narrow ridge. And more than that, when you go apically in the clinical aspect, in the photograph itself, you can see a large dip here. The, the width may, here may be a little bit more, but width as it go, goes apically is less. <clears throat> so what we thought of doing here is, we thought of placing the implant here and we thought of uh, doing something known as guided bone regeneration using bone grafts and uh, PRF and membranes. So we did a technique of, called as um, by expansion technique, okay? Ridge expansion was done. As, as I told you before, when we have a poor quality of bone, you can, ex you can expand the bone. When you have little bit of bone, you again, it can try to expand bone. That is one thing that we did here. So here, what you do is you do a pilot drilling. And then we have this instrument, which is known as osteotomes. So when you look here, the diameter of this osteotome is less, uh, no, or, or this one is more than this, this one is more than this, this one is more than that. So the size of the osteotome increases. So what you do is after this drilling, you just insert this osteotome of this, whatever width you want to expand and expand the bone and then place in front. <clears throat> so this was the after the flap was raised. You can see a very narrow ridge here. So this was where we did a primary uh, osteotomy using the pilot drill, two millimeter drill. This was with the parallel pin I told that was placed. So we so that it's parallel. It has gone sufficiently deep as we needed, and then we inserted the osteotomy. You can see the osteotomy that is being inserted to that <clears throat> uh, osteotomy site. You can see the size of this osteotome is more than this, okay? You try to expand this bone. Your bone is usually thin here. So after sufficient expansion, you are placing the bone. I mean, placing the implant. Here, uh, a narrow diameter implant was placed about just three millimeter because the, <clears throat> the ridge was narrow. 
And after the osteo, I mean, applying the implant, what you see, you see a tiny crack, but you have sufficient stability for this implant. So what you can do is you can decorticate this bone a little bit over here, place a bone graft here and place a membrane on the covering and then close the flap. Exactly that is what we did. So place, after decorticating, we place this uh, graft over here. Then we place, you can see a PRF membrane is what we used here. And then we close the graft, I mean, close the flap. Primary closure was obtained. This was the post-operative photograph that you can see here. And <clears throat> this is after the restoration. So we took this patient from this stage to this stage. So <clears throat> we didn't do a, a initially a guided bone regeneration first. Then we waited for, uh, asked the patient to wait for so long period of time. But at the time of surgery itself, along with the implant placement, we did all this. So we modified the surgical technique. So the overall treatment time for this patient was reduced to a great extent. This is very important when you talk about anterior maxilla. <clears throat> now, when you look at posterior teeth, what you see in posterior teeth is, uh, so in posterior teeth, what happens is sinus pneumatizes, as I told you before. The, the, the length, the height in which you can place implants is actually compromised here. So when you have the sinus pneumatization, you can do actually do a sinus lift. You can lift the membrane without uh, tearing this Schneiderian membrane, okay? And then place an implant. You can either do by two techniques. The first technique is known as an indirect sinus lift. So you are not opening the sinus, but indirectly through the edentinous space, you do a osteotomy you reached to the base of this sinus. And what you do once you have reached into the base of the sinus, what you can do is you can put a little bit of bone graft and then push the bone graft so that it will just lift off the sinus. Wherever sufficiently, sufficient bone graft you place, lift off the sinus and then place the implant here. So from this height, you have achieved this height. This is known as indirect sinus lift. I'll show you a case. This was a case that came to us. You can see in the posterior maxilla, the height was less. And when you look down here, you know, this tooth has supraerupted. So we, we thought of uh, correcting the occlusion. So we did an intentional RCT for this patient and gave a crown for that patient so that uh, the occlusion was corrected over here. <coughs> so, <coughs> sorry. So uh, we went about the with the drilling and then we... We use these osteotomes to do this indirect sinus lift. You can see that this, the tip is inside the sinus. Uh, you can see the implant within the sinus. And from this situation, we took this patient to this situation. And this is the post op I told you the occlusion was corrected, crown was given here. And this is the implants that was placed here. So this is an indirect sinus lift. Now, another case <coughs> of su direct sinus augmentation. Now, when you look at this case, you know, this area was edentulous. That is the one six area. But this patient had generalized periodontitis. Okay. So we treated this periodontitis uh, uh, areas. And uh, this tooth had grade three mobility, very poor bone. Uh, so we thought of removing this, I mean, this tooth and placing two implants here. So when we took the CBCT, look at the height is only just 3.3 millimeter. So we thought of doing a <coughs> direct sinus augmentation here. So what is direct sinus augmentation? Now, if you have, this is a normal, and this is an expanded sinus, you have very little bone here. So what you do here is on the side, you lift up a flap, you open up an entrance like this, okay? And then through the lateral area, you try to lift up the membrane, fill all this area with bone graft. And once the bone graft, wait for a, about six months of time so the graft get <coughs> somewhat converted to bone. And then you go ahead and place an implant here. And this is known as direct sinus augmentation. <clears throat> this is the edentulous space, the clinical photographs. This is the tooth that was extracted. So after extracting the tooth, we cut a window here. And the window here was cut with a piezo surgery. 
okay and this is the piece of surgery by which you know yeah, we are near to the membrane now now the membrane is slightly lifted here this whole area was filled with bone graft particular bone graft and this was the initial stage <clears throat> you can see the lining of the sinus this is the initial stage and look here and this has gone up you can see that you know you can see the bone this is a filled with bone graft. There's no tear in the membrane. If there was a tear in the membrane, you could have seen all this bone graft. You wouldn't have seen this graft here and you wouldn't have got a line like this here. And <clears throat> later on, after waiting, we placed implants. This is indirect, I mean, this is direct sinus lift. So these are some of the surgical modifications that we have. Next, the last thing that I'm going to tell you briefly is about the prosthetic consideration. I'm not going deep into prosthetic consideration because we have one lecture that is coming up by one of our team, Dr. Manu, very soon, which is on prosthetic consideration. So the important thing is after placing an implant, the, you have to load it with the processes. Okay. You have different types of abutment. You would have heard about straight or angled abutment. When you have placed an implant in correct angulation, you can give a straight abutment. Otherwise, you probably have to use an angled abutment so that the processes come in line. And your processes have to be either a screw retained or cement retained. I'll just show you that. Now, <clears throat> this is a process that is, uh, that's an implant that is properly angulated and placed. So here, you need a straight abutment only. Okay. But here, the, this is angulated. So this abutment is modified so this this is an angled abutment <clears throat> okay so that the processes can be brought into that into the line angle so that the process will go in and fit so that is about straight and angled abutments <clears throat> now similar to your crown and bridge what you can do is this is something called as abutment that is prop, that is attached to the implant so you place an abutment you can shape the abutment and take an impression and give to the lab and the lab will give you a crown and similar to your usual crown and bridge you can just cement this implant directly or that is known as cement retained crowns but sometimes what you do in the lab itself this this uh, abutment and the crown is being cemented together and it is being attached to the implant by means of a screw here also use, use a screw, but use a screw and attach the abutment and later then you cement it. But here it is being cemented by a screw and that screw hole is being covered by means of some composite. So that is screw retake. <clears throat> now this one case, which we, the, the earlier case I showed you for CBCT, this is the, uh, with the abutment and this is the final processes that you can see, okay? Now, what is a take-home message? Now, <clears throat> when any of you, if you are going to practice implantology, my advice to you is see the end in the beginning. Now, <clears throat> the concept of implantology also have changed. In the earlier years, the concept was something called as bone-derived. But the present concept is something called as prosthetically derived or prosthetically driven implantology. What is prosthetically driven implantology? Bone derived was whenever, the, wherever bone is there, you place an implant. When the patient came for the prosthetic phase, it may be angulated, somehow you had to manage. Most of the time you would have given an implant to the patient, but it would have been aesthetic to the, to the patient. Unless and until <coughs> the implant that you give you as a surgeon or an implantologist is satisfied and the patient is also satisfied unless that is achieved your implant is a failure so always you have to see the end in the beginning okay you have to see where your final process what type of processes that you are going to give to a patient and based on that you are going to place an implant now if you have to plan like that some sub cases there may be deficiency in width or length or height or whatever dimension you have to create that there are umpteen number of techniques by which you can grow or increase the volume of bone and then you place in the implant in a prosthetically 
good position and then give a ideal process to the patient. So see the end in the beginning. So implantology, every step has to be planned in advance. And uh, the success of implant is based on meticulous planning and careful execution. Ladies and gentlemen, all of you would have seen this structure. This is one of the tallest structures in the world, if not the tallest. It's the Burj Khalifa. But you know, it was not made, just it was not erected. Look, there was meticulous planning right from the foundation to each step in which the Burj was made. So this is the way you should plan <coughs> implants. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I would like to thank my team. This is my team at Anur. Um, all of them, have the, all the cases that I've shown you before, every all of them have had their part. And um, I'm happy to say that um, we, as team Anur, are going to uh, organize a course of uh, basic and advanced implantology uh, in the month of February. That is 7th, 8th, and 9th. It is a five-day course on you, you will have an idea about all aspects of implant. Every participant will be given a chance to place implant on patients. If you are willing, we are willing to give implant, allowing you to place implants on multiple patients. Okay. You will have a good idea about CBCT, all the advanced surgical techniques, PR of bone grafting, prosthetic aspects, everything is there. there. Okay. You can take a screenshot of this. These are the person whom you can call. You can get a good idea about this or you can contact even the online dentistry people. They will guide you about this course. So I, I hope that um, if, if you have any doubts, uh, we'll get you cleared. At the same time, I request all of you can utilize this so that um, you can uh, learn the art of implantology to the full. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, it was, uh, I mean, it's 9 and it's almost 10 p.m., 10, 15 p.m., okay? And uh, thank you all. Thank you all for patient listening. If there are any questions we can take also. Sir, we have a question in the chat box. So how to do decortication procedure? <coughs> decortication is something that we usually do look when you have a cortical bone uh, the problem is when you have a cortical cortical bone if you place bone grafts over there you won't get vascularity so what you have to do is you have to decorticate the bone at some areas you can use small burst <coughs> rotary burst at low speed okay use your regular uh, air rotor handpiece or you can attach this or use your uh, the drills you can use for the osteotomy for implants and slightly decorting it so that there will be bleeding points. Okay. When there are bleeding points, this provides vascularity for the graft. So the graft will be uptaken. So that is a way of going about with decortication. Okay. Thank you, sir. We have another question from Dr. Balasarva Kumar. Is there any contraindication for immediate implant placement? <clears throat> the usual, look, the, the basic idea when you do an immediate implant placement is you should, the implant should be stable, okay? So you need at least three or four millimeter of bone beyond your extraction socket so that your implant is going to be stable. If that is there, you can place implant. The another contraindication there is if you have a large periapical lesion that is that cannot be controlled, then you can't. Okay, that is going to deter the uh, that is going to cause failure then. Right. Thank you, sir. Chat box is filling up for one more. Uh, from Dr. Shainas, which bone graft is best for GBR? <clears throat> yes, that's a that's a very good question, Shainas. Look, <clears throat> there is no magic bone graft that is available okay so you have to look each bone graft has got a lot of their own inherent properties uh, some uh, are very osteoconductive okay osteoinductive but some bone grafts resolve very fast some bone graft dis doesn't resolve so basically you 
can combine different bone grafts. Okay, you you what you have to think is you should know what is the purpose there in giving a bone graft. How long that bone graft should there over a period of time. So depending upon that, you can use a cocktail of bone graft. That is my suggestion. So there's not single bone graft. Use different types of bone grafts. Thank you, sir. So another interesting question. Uh, excess of torque application during insertion of implant can exert an outward pressure and resorbs bone. What can we do to minimize <coughs> it? Yeah, look, uh, literature suggests that when uh, actually you induce too much of pressure, one thing is that uh, that is too much of uh, forces at the interface, which can have a deterrent effect on the implant. So thing is, you know, <clears throat> whenever you are drilling, you, you can actually feel when the drill goes through, you can you can feel the, the resistance there. So depending upon that, you have to do an osteotomy, okay? <clears throat> Usually, you uh, if you are doing an uh, uh, implant size of, considering an implant size of 4.2 millimeter, usually you drill till about 3.65. What you can do in such cases to reduce the, the torque there is use the next drill also, okay? Use the next drill, but don't grow fully, but probably half so that you can reduce the torque. Thank you, sir. Moving on to one more relevant question. The chat box is really filling up. So for diabetes patients, up to what value of hba <coughs> can we place in plants? <coughs> Look, the basic uh, idea is, you know, if you have something less than seven, that is a good idea. HPA1C levels less than seven and uh, over a period of time, okay? That will give a good idea about the diabetic status and you know that it's about controlled and such patients are candidates for that. So if it is not coming down, you ask the patient to consult the diabetologist and adjust the uh, regime or uh, with diet or exercise, control the blood sugar and then again, uh, do the blood check once again, then we'll go about with implant placement. Moving on to the last question for the day. Uh, the query is likewise, during removal of healing abutment, implant gets loosened up. So is there any way to save the implant? <clears throat> Look, uh, an implant that is mobile, it's a failed implant. The slightest of mobility to that implant is a failed implant. Now, I've seen many cases where during the placement of healing abutment, the implant is mobile the patient is totally asymptomatic, okay? And even after you remove the implant, you find there is no granulation tissue. In fact, you can see the threads of the implant in the bone also. But if you have a mobile implant, definitely just remove the implant, graft that area, then go about with implant placement at a later stage. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful session. Uh, we can see the overwhelming session. The session is overwhelming, so we can see it in the chat box, in fact. So thank you for joining with Online Industry. So we've come to the end of the session. So we'll follow up with the next session on 28th of this month, the last Wednesday of this month by 9 p.m. We'll have another wonderful session. Thank you all. Have a good night. And thank you, sir, for the wonderful session. Thank you, Anita. Thank you.